Quint is the first to appear in the film. I think that sequence works quite well because we use the sound to indicate to the audience that something peculiar was going to happen. We didn't know exactly what. And as I recall, what we did was get a shot of the pigeons. Jack fell in love with pigeons on The Innocents, by the way, um, and became a pigeon fancier par excellence and won prizes. However, I, I wanted the pigeons to reveal Quint because I knew that the sound of the flapping wings would help. If you look at the film, you will see that I've stretched the pigeon shot so that it's in slow motion. It's one of those sort of now you see it, now you don't. Did you see it? Did she see it? Was it real? Was it not real? These things had to be experimented with, of course, before we got them right. As far as I recall, Jack had read The Turn of the Screw, the novella, as a child. And I think he'd always remembered that particular book. And of course, you mustn't forget that Jack had no father. And anything to do with children interested him. The film is based on a play which was written by William Archibald, an American. But when it came to adapting the script, he was unhappy with Archibald's play script. And he turned to a variety of English writers, including John Mortimer, who did a version of it. And finally, he turned to Truman Capote, which was a stroke of genius, really. They had met previously on a film called Beat the Devil, which Truman also wrote. Truman had a sort of interest in the Gothic and in the relationship between the ghosts and the children. I think that Truman really knew what he was doing with that. I just think he felt that Truman would add that little bit of extra a frisson to the picture. I think he, he felt that Truman had that juxtaposition, it's a long English word, uh, between uh, hor horror, fear and, and beauty. I remember when I started work on the film, which was at the start of shooting, that Truman was still around and I think he was on the set quite a bit writing lines for the children, additional dialogue and so on. Well, Jack and I had been great friends for many years and we spoke movies all the time. And so Jack just let me read the script. The reason he asked me to make the film, not just because I was with his friend, but because he knew that I would make it look the way he would like it. When I do a film, I light everybody in it and everything in it exactly as I see it when I read the script. You know, people get the wrong ideas about this. Jack and I just discussed the film as a project and by discussing it, we both see it the same way in our minds. You know, everything I did in the picture was something I do automatically. I very rarely sit down for long periods of time and put my head in my hand and think, how am I going to do that? The actual carrying out the photography is simple because I'm a photographer. I used filters at the side so that we could, I could close the picture in because it was in cinemascope, as you know, and occasionally we didn't, we'd, we didn't want it that wide, so I would shadow it in a bit from the sides. Throughout the film, the edges go in and out and without obviously noticing. They don't go completely black, they just go dark. One or two filters, I just roughly painted on glass and put them in front of the, the lens. 
we did go on location to this stately called Sheffield Park and Deborah walked through the park. She meets Pamela Franklin for the first time and then goes up to the house. And Wilfred Shingleton, of course, had been the production designer and had built the facade of Bly House beautifully at, uh, at Shepperton. The actual terrace of the house where Pamela Franklin sees the roses and this wonderful piece of dialogue by Truman Capote where she says, um, oh, look at this lovely spider eating a butterfly. Very Truman Capote line. Oh, look, the lovely spider and it's eating a butterfly. That was all studio. So, in fact, the gardens themselves and the railway station where Martin Stevens comes back from school, and that was all shot on location, but apart from that, everything was shot in the studio. The combination of the real location near Brighton and Sheffield Park and the set represented exactly what Jack wanted, that there was a sort of feeling of space in as much as the, the place, the house and the grounds were large, but there was an enclosed feeling as well on the interiors. A great sequence in the movie is Deborah, when she goes upstairs with the candles, because she feels that there are whispering ghosts in the house. I had special candles made up, and I think they had four or five wicks in each candle to give it much more light. From my point of view, it was a nightmare because the candles burned down very, very quickly. And so it was very, very difficult to match the candles from one scene to another because you would come to take five or six when she would be outside a door and the candles would have burnt down to very low, but by the time she came into the next scene, they could be high again because which take would you ever match to? So it was a nightmare from that point of view, but it is a wonderful sequence in the movie. And though to me, when I watch the film, I, I'm inclined to watch the candles go up and down, nobody else does. <laughs> I don't recall that it was a difficult film to cut, but it was very difficult getting the effects right. For example, the quint appearance at the window. I remember there being a lot of discussion on the set when that scene was shot, how to bring him in. I think there were sort of like roller skate wheels on a little tray so that he was rolled into the window and appears very smoothly, coming closer and closer. Daddy, where are you? Oh! <laughs> the main difficulties on cutting of the innocence was making sure that the children were not overplaying. Jack and I were very cautious about choosing the material. Of course, it's very important that a director does get on well with children. If you get a, if you get a director who has a rapport with the children, you'll get a good performance. The children understood exactly what Jack was trying to do. He was very, very good with the children. Pamela Franklin was making her first film as a child, whereas Martin Stevens was a professional child actor. I never remember there being any problem with Martin Stevens in doing any of those scenes, either the scene where he had to kiss Deborah Carr passionately or try to strangle her, or anything like that. No, I think that uh, Martin Stevens enjoyed playing the part and played it very well. Deborah was very conscious of the fact that it was important that the children had a good time. Working with Jack from the start was a, a pleasure because Jack was a consummate filmmaker and he had a very light touch on the set. He could be quite ferocious off the set. Every night he wanted to see the cut of the film until he'd finished shooting, which was an extraordinary way of working, really. It was very time consuming, but he loved his film and because he could see everything cut together, rather swiftly, he was able to make adjustments, pick up additional shots, um, 
and we could discuss how the film was going um, almost every night. He can't help us. He's perhaps the only one who can. When it came to the montage of long dissolves and superimpositions, that was the first time that I had had experience of that kind of scene. And therefore, I had to invent a way of doing it. I had the elements that Jack had shot, and the only way I could work it out and supply the optical house with a, some form of template was by cutting it with blank film. I used, I used spacing, what we called spacing, which was blank film. There was no image on it. What I would do was get the, the piece of film that had the image on it, that was the piece I wanted to use, and I would write the edge numbers on a piece of blank film with the slate number. So that the, what we ended up with were four rolls of film which had no images on them but had numbers written on them and indications of how long those shots should remain on the screen. So that you would find that you have a superimposition followed by a dissolve. Sometimes you had four images running simultaneously. Other times you had two. The laboratory and the optical house were quite bemused by this. They'd never been faced with anything like this before. Although, of course, montages had been around for years, in Hollywood particularly. Interpretation of the story is always debatable. Did Miss Giddens love the uncle? Was she under some sort of spell? Was she a frustrated spinster? Is the whole film a psychosexual drama? We never really knew. We used to talk about it a lot. I don't think Jack himself quite knew what was going on in Miss Giddens' head. And so we kept the whole thing as really a question mark, as a query as to, as to why this story ever occurred. I don't know that Henry James ever explained it either. 